uh, the event. I will give an overview of the evol uh, evolution of the pandemic in these countries, uh, responses to uh, uh, the policy responses, notably designed uh, to enhance the capacity of the uh, healthcare uh, system and also to curb uh, the evolution of uh, the pandemic in these countries. Uh, overall, if we want to make an overall assessment of what we've seen based on uh, all the data that we have collected and also the uh, work that has been collected uh, since uh, a couple of years, the region, uh, based on means these countries, display overall uh, a shallow level of testing and insufficient data to monitor the prevalence of the disease effectively. And this assessment also uh, show uh, rather low levels of healthcare sector uh, resilience overall, speaking overall, but there were uh, some uh, exceptions. Now, uh, as we could see, uh, overall, these countries were engaged in short term emergency measures to contain the pandemic and also lacking in certain uh, way, medium to long term plans to improve the healthcare sector and also uh, clear uh, measures to recover from the pandemic. Um, also, this is based on their uh, difficult, or say, uh, fiscal low fiscal space that they have been displaying over uh, over uh, the years. Uh, so let me uh, start uh, with the uh, first, uh, I would say, the pandemic evolution and policy responses that I mentioned. Uh, so almost all countries uh, faced a first a pandemic wave during March and April 2020 second wave between November 2020, January 2021, and after 2020, all target countries faced another increase of cases during the spring of 2021. So really all countries have followed this type of uh, evolution. Um, now, uh, many countries uh, have managed to keep uh, overall uh, cases, um, I would say, uh, under control. So, so for example, particularly in winter 2020-2021, uh, and then uh, we know that they have faced another wave uh, in summer 2021, particularly Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia. Um, and then. Sorry, uh, Professor. Um, there is the repeated uh, question in the chat function if it's possible to have the slide view so that it's better visible for the participant. Voila. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so at the uh, at the uh, December 2021, 20, uh, uh, as I mentioned, most countries were facing new waves in uh, in uh, of the pandemic, and uh, neither the healthcare systems nor the governmental responses seem to have improved much after one year uh, in the pandemic. So we've seen uh, this evolution, as you can see in all these uh, graphs, uh, on a uh, on a on a upward uh, trend. Now, uh, what we also would like to ex uh, explore in the next uh, slide and also in the, uh, in the, in the study, the evolution uh, of the pandemic that we have mentioned already, but also the policy answer since uh, 2021. And here uh, we can see, for example, that uh, when we assess the preparedness uh, and resilience of the healthcare uh, systems, um, what we have uh, looked at, at is, the, uh, is the Global Health Security Index, which is uh, publicly available, uh, and it is uh, assessed uh, for all the countries uh, of the world. And this index uh, normally ranges between zero and uh, 100. Um, and the global, uh, the global Health Security Index score, so uh, worldwide, it's rather low, it's 38.9. Uh, but then it has also decreased from 2019, uh, and this uh, data is for uh, 2021. So practically, uh, except uh, for Jordan, which has seen an increase of the score, which is above uh, global average, all the region, uh, country, uh, all the countries in the region means Egypt, uh, Algeria, Georgia, uh, sorry, Lebanon, Morocco, Palestine, Tunisia have seen a decrease and they are uh, practically uh, below the global uh, average. Now, uh, if we uh, look at uh, the health expenditures, uh, generally they are low as compared, uh, uh, I mean, uh, they are between 5.8 and 8% 8 of uh, GDP in the available years, it means we only got data for 2018, but then 
generally they should be at least uh, at 12 percent uh, and this is the threshold that the who recommends for countries to uh, start uh, seeing the improvement of their health uh, care uh, systems and this is a uh, very important also to, to try to target these uh, these numbers uh, going forward but then again there are some difficulties in terms of the uh, fiscal space, as, as I mentioned, and then, of course, how to uh, manage the investment within uh, within the budget of each country. Now, if we look at the uh, out-of-pocket expenditures, uh, all countries still have high uh, amounts there. And then uh, also, uh, we've seen that there were some sporadic announcements uh, to increase the investment in the healthcare sector, but these were uh, not uh, so supported by uh, data. So it would be great to see uh, going forward uh, whether, uh, whether the investment is really uh, allocated in the healthcare sector to fight for future uh, pandemic and maybe extension of this uh, and this uh, of this one. Now, uh, as I mentioned at the, uh, my introduction, um, we are focusing on the testing capacity to assess in reality the prevalence uh, of the uh, pandemic. Now, all countries lack available data for uh, the COVID-19 test uh, performed, uh, and uh, there are, I would say, some deficient levels. Only these two countries, as you see, the green, the Jordan, and Morocco, the yellow, where uh, we, the data is available. Uh, so it is important really to uh, improve at least the data accessibility for uh, the other uh, countries. Now, in terms of the price of uh, testing, this is also another uh, very important um, factor which needs to be uh, looked at. In several cases, uh, for example, uh, the uh, cost of this um, testing has been reduced, uh, particularly, for example, in the case of Algeria and uh, Egypt. But still, uh, it costs money and it's quite uh, expensive. Uh, so, of course, it has been used in a way to incentivize traveling. Um, but then uh, still uh, more needs to be done in that sense to ensure that these tests are accessible to everybody. So then there is incentives, there are incentives to test and to get the information. Um, so, uh, as for the production uh, of tests, uh, Algeria and Morocco have started producing tests domestically, for example, in 2021, 2020, sorry. Uh, but then again, uh, these prices remain uh, rather high. And as you can see in this table, um, if we look at the minimum wage, uh, still there is a lot to be done in those countries to ensure that uh, there is accessibility and affordability of those uh, tests. Uh, the next slide is, uh, shows the uh, policy responses to, uh, to curb the pandemic in the, in the short run. And we know very much that uh, the uh, immediate answer of the government uh, was to use a combination of measures of uh, lockdown, social distancing, uh, restriction of movement, travel restriction and all of this, and also establishing the state of emergency except for the case of uh, Egypt. And then we looked at the uh, government response stringency index, which is prepared by uh, academic and it's really available to uh, assess the uh, government uh, response uh, over the period. We can see that the stringency has been going down up to December 2021. Uh, and this also shows that the uh, new uh, factor, which has been a determinant for the less stringency is the vaccine. And we will talk about it later on. So, um, so this is also an important uh, dimension of why uh, the stringency has gone uh, down in all countries and hopefully uh, it will continue as, as, as such. It means that uh, there is a kind of a management or short term uh, management of the pandemic uh, while also the vaccination has gained uh, momentum and has been generalized in all uh, countries. Now I would like to focus, as I mentioned, on the, uh, on the vaccine procurement rollout and implications. And this has been a cornerstone for the policy or governmental answer to curb the pandemic uh, over 2021. Um, so um, what we are trying to do here is to examine the vaccine uh, procurement availability and the different types and amounts of vac vaccine administrated. 
so uh, what we have seen overall based on the assessment in these countries uh, that uh, the vaccine procurement and ro uh, rollout analysis show an overall unequal distribution of vaccines preventing an equal uh, recovery and also um, in a way uh, uh, delaying the uh, management of of the uh, evolution of the pandemic. So uh, we uh, try to show here that um, many uh, vaccines have been approved rather uh, quickly. Uh, if we look at the overall uh, timeline of approval of uh, vaccine, uh, and then uh, nine vaccines are listed on the WHO uh, emerging uh, use uh, listing, as you can see it here. Uh, South and East Mediterranean countries did not coordinate their uh, vaccine purchase, uh, but rather participated in this international and regional platforms to procure and administer vaccines, like the COVAX or the AVAT, and these are all they have benefited from this. Uh, also, uh, we can see that the region has been um, rather uh, using uh, uh, diversified, uh, diversified vaccines via, for example, bilateral, multilateral, donations and others. Uh, and then you can see uh, in, the, um, in, in, in the slide uh, on the right uh, side, so in, uh, in the different uh, countries. So uh, there have been many campaigns, for example, uh, in, uh, in, in all the countries, except for example, for Palestine, they started a bit late. Uh, prioritizing really the healthcare workers starting, uh, for example, with uh, Chinese and Russian uh, vaccines received uh, mainly via donations uh, and uh, uh, import. So as you can see here, uh, there is a, a differentiation, in fact, in terms of the vaccines delivered by type and the supply uh, mechanisms. Again, I repeat, uh, there has not been any um, coordination of effort between those, uh, between those uh, countries. Uh, so, uh, in this slide, uh, slide you can see that uh, these are the total million doses delivered to countries uh, per vaccine uh, type. Uh, and then you can see that the numbers uh, vary as well. Uh, of course, in, uh, at, at the point in time, uh, the numbers were rather low, but then they improved and they increased uh, over, uh, over uh, time. Uh, but then if we look specifically at uh, each one uh, of them, we can see that, for example, Alge Algeria vaccine portfolio uh, was composed ma mainly by China and Janssen, uh, which is the US uh, vaccine. Um, also Palestine, mainly from uh, Moderna, which is also uh, uh, from uh, the uh, US. Uh, Morocco also relies on Sinopharm, while Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon and Tunisia also uh, opted for a diversified portfolio of uh, suppliers of uh, vaccines. Uh, so this is uh, the situation of the vaccines and we can see clearly that there is a diversification uh, of uh, the different uh, from the different suppliers in the different uh, countries. Uh, now, as I mentioned uh, previously, uh, the coverage was more or less, um, I would say, uh, and as I mentioned, uh, very much unequal. You, you can look, for example, in Palestine, in Lebanon, in Tunisia, the coverage is much lower than when we look in the case of uh, Morocco or, uh, uh, for example, in Morocco, it's almost 120%. Um, and this, um, in fact, uh, because as, uh, up to December 2021, most uh, target countries have not procured enough vaccines to cover 100% of the population, except for, as I mentioned, uh, Morocco. Now, um, also, we, uh, we, we need to think uh, that if we want to compare uh, with uh, countries like Switzerland or Canada or other countries in Europe, we are you know, these countries have uh, procured much, uh, much lower uh, numbers. Uh, and this is also something to be uh, looked at uh, uh, going forward when uh, there is uh, this type of uh, pandemic. But also there has been quite of a debate uh, on the patent waivers uh, and which was uh, in a way blocked by the, uh, the, uh, Western, uh, the Western countries. And this is also something which um, uh, should be should be looked at, and probably there might be some partnership going forward on how to produce um, jointly uh, certain uh, certain um, vaccines going uh, forward. 
now, uh, here, um, of course, uh, there are, we want to dwell into the sources of vaccine inequity and also the implications of, uh, of, of this from a socioeconomic perspective. Um, we can see that in all countries, there is a, an equal fiscal space uh, um, among them. And this is also uh, because of the difficulties that they have been going through over, uh, over the period uh, uh, before uh, the pandemic. Uh, also, overall, uh, there has been a lack of transparency in prices conditions of the vaccine, uh, which, in fact, uh, if we look at specifically the prices, they affect uh, dramatically the capacity of low and middle income countries to buy uh, those. So we need to have uh, much more rules on uh, transparency of the uh, prices and conditions of, uh, of uh, purchase. And also, as we know very well, the pharmaceutical co companies, they are not uh, public, or say government owned, or uh, even if government owned, they have to make profit. Uh, but then if you look at the prices, they really vary very much uh, from one provider to another provider. And also, as I mentioned, uh, the uh, manufacturing technology transfer, it is uh, mainly based on the uh, debate of uh, the uh, patent uh, waiver. And uh, another aspect uh, which has been uh, very determinant in the distribution of the vaccines, it's also the um, uh, channels of distribution and storage, and there were different uh, conditions for uh, the different type of vaccines to, um, to be easily distributed to uh, those countries. And overall, uh, there are what we call the culture factors, uh, which, uh, for example, uh, some are hesitant to uh, use the vaccine because of cultural religion. And also there has been uh, many uh, debates and theories uh, on why those vaccines were probably very quickly developed. And this has uh, added to the hesitancy of, uh, of the people to, uh, to vaccinate. Now, the second part of my presentation will uh, look at the socioeconomic consequences of COVID-19 from a macro, micro and sectoral perspective. Uh, and then uh, we are trying also here to use data up to uh, 2021. Overall, uh, the impact uh, during 2021, and hopefully we will recover, but as you can see, the num numbers here in terms of the growth rate, uh, unemployment rate, all the disruptions in the global value chain, uh, and then also the uh, an upward trend of inflation rates and food prices uh, worldwide, the picture is rather bleak, and it will continue uh, to, to, to show a, a, a bleak picture because also of the disruptions that are uh, being created now uh, with the war in uh, in Ukraine. So even the estimations of the uh, of the IMF up to 2026, as you see it uh, in here, might have to be uh, revisited uh, in the, with the with the uncertainties and conflicts that we are living uh, currently. Uh, some countries uh, are, uh, or I would say, have been suffering much more than others. Uh, for example, if we look at the case of Egypt, Egypt has been uh, withstanding the crisis uh, much better than others. And this is the uh, yellow line on the right, the left side of the graph. Um, so it's practically the only country that did not go uh, negative in terms of growth rate. And this is, uh, this is, um, uh, an interesting case to look at. Uh, now, in the case of uh, Lebanon, which is uh, uh, which has uh, really gone, it's the blue line, and you can see even there is no available estimations for uh, recovery. I mean, the country has gone through multiple crisis situation, um, and uh, with what is happening, as I mentioned before, uh, in the, this might uh, continue. And then without talking about the overall disruptions in the global value chain, and this has impacted dramatically some of the uh, countries. And again, inflation rates, uh, as you can see, uh, this is, uh, there is an upward trend uh, in uh, globally, but then it will probably uh, be exacerbated uh, going forward uh, because of the increasing uh, food and energy uh, prices. Now, on terms of the sectoral assessment, small and medium-sized enterprises and especially micro-enterprises in uh, sectors like 
uh, like uh, tourism and poultry creative industry, leisure industry and uh, have been hardly hit uh, by the pandemic. Uh, we're hoping that the digital economy would uh, continue and could be a factor of resilience, uh, but now would be uh, uh, global uncertainties in the digital sector and then all the cyber uh, attacks and all these uh, matters that are not yet dealt with. This is uh, bringing a large risk uh, going forward uh, in the digital economy. So this needs to be an action to ensure that the digital economy is an opportunity, not a threat uh, going uh, forward, particularly in an uncertain period of, uh, of uh, conflicts and disruptions. Now, uh, the labor market has been uh, largely uh, impacted uh, because in, in reality, uh, um, the work behavior has changed during the uh, pandemic. So the majority of people have been working uh, in, front on, in front of their computers. Um, of course, uh, there is a uh, decline uh, of the amount of uh, paid work. Uh, so there has been a loss of income overall. Um, also, um, there is a disparity between, uh, or I would say, gender disparity, and there is uh, there are uh, there is evidence that uh, um, women have been much more impacted uh, than male counterparts. Uh, but then, at the same time, we might think that this could also provide an opportunity because telework teleworking capacity in the region could be enhanced. But then, it needs to be. Uh, developed uh, with uh, a serious reflection on uh, the uh, labor market and also on how to change the labor contracts uh, that to make it much more digitalized and even linking this to tax policy and other matters that need to be thought of uh, uh, very seriously. Now, on the social consequences, uh, obviously, uh, people in vulnerable groups uh, have uh, seen, um, have, have been hard, uh, hit very uh, hard during the pandemic, including, for example, the uh, informal workers, migrants, and also women. There is an increase of violence, for example, which I've seen and reported in many studies, um, and this needs to be also uh, dealt with um, very uh, seriously, but also, uh, we have some evidence that um, mental health uh, problems have increased in many countries, uh, and this should could become a, a new uh, aspect that needs to be dealt with in the healthcare sector, and uh, and this is also an important matter to uh, to to look at in the future. Now, I, I share with you here a slide on the debt because it's very important when we want to deal with the problems from a social perspective, because social security safety net uh, practically are very meager to, to, to be because of the uh, mounting debt situation in those countries. And we can clearly see that uh, if we look at two countries like Lebanon and Tunisia, these are all uh, two countries in very distressed situations. Uh, and then this situation might even uh, get exacerbated because of the increasing um, pressure on uh, uh, on energy and food prices. As we can see now, the barrel it's over hundred dollars, and then some of the um, uh, basic resources like wheat and others is increasing dramatically over the last couple of weeks. So uh, the picture is rather bleak because if there is not narrow fiscal spaces in those countries and there is dominance in informality, limited social protection system. So this all uh, will reduce the capacity of the countries to reform, uh, to do meaningful uh, reform. And at the same time, uh, puts further pressure on them and also uh, put further pressure on social, um, social, social uh, rest. Now, uh, based on this bleak picture, and I am sorry to share those uh, assessments, uh, um, we have certain recommendations, but those recommendations should be taken uh, from a medium term perspective. So just to reflect upon, and we can discuss those together in the discussion uh, section. Uh, first of all, um, uh, we need to, uh, I mean, those governments have to increase the, the investment in healthcare because the level of uh, investment of healthcare before the pandemic was very low. And I mentioned they need to reach a target of 12% as for GDP. Probably one solution would be to enhance uh, the private public partnerships, but then at the same time, they need to be very carefully regulated uh, to ensure that there is a uh, sharing uh, mechanisms and also. 
um, mechanisms that are overall uh, acceptable to the population and also promoting the uh, healthcare uh, coverage. But again, uh, this is, a, I would say, medium uh, to long-term uh, uh, recommendation and that needs to be tackled as soon as possible to ensure uh, that there is a vision for uh, enhancing the resilience of the healthcare uh, sector. Second recommendation is really we need to, uh, uh, they should be increasing disclosure reliability of data. This is important in uh, the healthcare uh, sector uh, to ensure that when there is a pandemic, there is clarity on uh, the prevalence of uh, those pandemics. And then this also enhances uh, the credibility of the government and also the trust between government and citizens, because we know that the data is one uh, one element. Okay, it's not the only element uh, of the social contract between the government and citizens, but it's fundamental to have transparency and the right disclosure. And this was very much uh, missing in, during this pandemic in many countries. Um, now, we also think that there is a uh, potential for more coordination between countries to learn from each other and also to help each other during, for example, uh, the procurement, uh, the production distribution of vaccines, and this was not the case. So I think it's also important to have a regional uh, reflection about, uh, about this, um, about this uh, matter, and I guess there are some regional uh, organizations, like, for example, the UFM or others that could take this role and uh, step up uh, this coordination uh, effort. Now, in the longer uh, term, uh, we said that there should be some buffer emergency schemes within the social security system for crisis situation. But again, the capacity of the country is so, uh, uh, I would say, uh, weak uh, that sometimes it's okay, we have to do this recommendation, but then they need to really deal with the debt situation and ensure that, for example, uh, there, there are some mechanisms, so for example, with the, um, with the uh, employers uh, to ensure that there is this type of uh, uh, social security system in crisis situation, because the government alone might not be able to, uh, to deal with it alone because of the uh, meager uh, fiscal situation they, ha they are, they are finding, the, finding themselves in. Also increasing investment in digital infrastructure, but also from a security point of view, security, cybersecurity point of view, because not only to have the accessibility, but also to ensure that if there are problems in terms of security, cybersecurity issues and so on, you know, there are the mechanisms to uh, prevent uh, that the digital infrastructure becomes completely inoperable, or not, not, not functioning at all. And also, again, in the long run education, I think uh, the educational system, we have done it in another study, uh, has been also very much uh, impacted by the pandemic, but there is an opportunity here in terms of digital education, um, and it should be in these countries uh, carefully looked at uh, based on what uh, I have uh, mentioned before. And then finally, um, since we know that the two sectors have been largely hit by the pandemic, tourism and uh, other leisure, uh, leisure sector, perhaps, um, in the next pandemics, there should be some kind of emergency funds to help those sectors not to completely disappear from, uh, from the economy. And uh, I would like to close here, Thomas. Uh, thank you very much for your, uh, for your attention and I'm ready for any questions. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Romayadi, for this excellent overview of the study, which I think uh, brought again all the most uh, important uh, parameters on the table, but also explained the background and the consequences and gave some policy recommendations. And now already, I would really uh, recommend everyone to uh, read the study once we publish it immediately after this webinar. But beforehand, we now have an expert uh, discussion with uh, our three distinguished uh, commentators and discussions. And I would like to start with uh, Dr. Samira el Wajri. As mentioned, she is the lead health specialist at the uh, World Bank. She has a, a tremendous experience on public health and works on this topic uh, since a number of years already. So we are very grateful that uh, you are with us, uh, Dr. Tuwajri. And I would like to give you directly the opportunity to 
comment on the study that was presented now by Rum Ayadi, and maybe also to look in general on the MENA region, um, looking at the health sector resilience during the pandemic. And maybe you could also speak about your assessment uh, of the pandemic and what lessons uh, we can learn uh, from uh, the results so far for future health crisis. So I would directly give you uh, the word and uh, kindly ask you to remain within uh, 10 minutes, please. So Dr. Uh, Tuwajri, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, Professor Ayadi had actually given us a lot of food for thought. So this was a very well done report, at least from the presentation. And it is consistent with what we're seeing in other parts of the world as well. I mean, what, 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 what she has described is very consistent with, with work and lessons learned we're seeing in Southeast Asia, for example, East Asia and the Pacific, and also some of the of Europe and the Central, uh, Central Asia countries. So th this is, um, as they say, misery loves company. So all of these countries are actually combating the same ailment and the same uh, uh, inefficiencies. Now, um, MENA is a mosaic, of course. I mean, we cannot really lump all of these countries into one basket, uh, but it's also an opportunity to, to compare and contrast. And uh, the countries that were involved in this, uh, in this uh, study provide a very good uh, background uh, because you don't end up actually um, comparing, uh, um, comparing oranges to, to, to apples. Uh, so the, this, the, the comparison, whether it's uh, in the preparedness or in the uh, procurement of the vaccines or in the public health measures is actually um, quite, quite useful, and especially the vaccine rollout. Let me just start, start by just giving you a flavor of what, what we've been doing at the World Bank. Yeah? And we've been in the heart of this as um, everyone knows. At the beginning, we were actually focused on saving lives. So that was uh, the relief, the restructuring and the resilient recovery. And then um, followed by protecting poor and vulnerable populations and ensuring sustainable business growth and job creation. And then again, strengthening policies, institutions and investments. And in that, we really have done a lot of work and a lot of investments, whether it's uh, through our international development assistant um, envelope, which is the IDA, or through technical assistance to the uh, IBRD countries. And, and most of the countries that were listed are actually among those. I think it's also noteworthy to look at two countries in MENA, which is Yemen and Syria, who have an ongoing conflict. And, the, the data and, and the preparations that are coming from these two countries is, is not scarce only, it's actually uh, painfully uh, absent to the point that you, you don't know where to start when it comes to uh, rendering assistance. I would agree completely with the data scarcity in, in, in Professor Ayadi's um, uh, presentation, and also more than the lack of data, actually the inaccuracy of data, because uh, you're building a lot of modeling and a lot of assistance based on something that does not really make sense on the ground. And uh, when it comes to the policy responses, I think there was a universal agreement on, you know, declaring a state of emergency, restriction of movements, travel restrictions. But I think what was lacking and almost universally is this simple model of public health kicking in in a, in a, in a pandemic which is really testing, uh, contact tracing, case detections, and, and quarantine or follow-up. And until we got the vaccine, we were really going around in circles, looking at different aspects of what testing means, besides the affordability, because, besides the, um, the uh, availability and access, and also the dynamics between the, the demand and supply and everything that goes, goes in between. Um, I'm, I'm also quite, quite um, uh, pleased with the vaccine hesitancy discussion. I think this is deeper than what was presented, uh, but uh, I think this was one of the um, very, very big hurdles that we have faced, not just in, in MENA, but actually all around the world. And uh, stemming from many different factors, sociocultural or the, or the conspiracy theory and what have you. Now, I just wanna stop at um, how countries are actually um, uh, have been losing on, on the health expenditure. And, and I came across a study a couple of days ago within the World Bank uh, ecosystem that looks at how much developed countries actually have lost in, in um, spending on health 
compared to you know, 0.6, for example, to 2.5 between Kenya and Canada. And I, I just want to flag out the fact that most of the Southern countries are actually spending less than they expect to do in, on health in general uh, out of the GDP. And that's why the, the, the decrease is small, it's minute, uh, because it's really a relativity question more than, more than anything else. Um, we cannot emphasize enough the access to primary health care as a, as a proxy to universal health coverage. If we actually had good functioning systems within, within the region and within these countries of primary care, then we probably would have had a better chance at looking at the universal, universal health systems, uh, health system. And um, at least within, within the bank, and I am sure uh, within other UN agencies, you know, WHO, and others, um, there had always been the lessons we have extracted from Ebola. And Ebola taught us, it taught us, it taught us anything, it's really the emphasis we have to have on the pandemic preparedness. And uh, we went actually uh, for, for a long time, having a percentage of our projects uh, dedicated to, to pandemic preparedness, and then we lost the ball uh, most of, um, uh, as, as we went on, you know, because we were out of the woods. Um, Sort of. So there is a health security summit in London, I think next week, that's going to look exclusively at pandemic preparedness because health security is also part of the global security, not just uh, for pandemics. Now, all the policy recommendations are actually um, uh, right on the dot. And as I said, it does, it does um, answer to most of, the, uh, most of the questions and most of the background that we are dealing with. I am not sure about the regional collaboration. There are regional bodies within MENA um, that have been around for a very long time uh, and that's outside the UN system. And I'm not sure if there is actually an opportunity to, to, to tap into these uh, regional bodies and regional authorities and look at uh, one pandemic preparedness or health security for, for, for all for the region again, given the mosaism of all of these countries and the amount they spend on health and you know, their relationship with donors and their access to essential medicines, including but not limited to vaccine. Finally, I think we cannot, we cannot uh, overlook the uh, importance of equity in, 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 the, in the pandemic as a whole. I think if we learned anything on the sociocultural dimensions and the social determinants of health of this pandemic is that it's actually uh, a stark experience of inequities. Um, we know that there has been um, many, many uh, differentials in testing, in access to um, vaccines, in quarantine, in isolation, in uh, you know access to 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 uh, social protection and assistance. And there, this was also an integral part of Professor Ayad's presentation. Social protection systems in MENA are not. Uh, advanced, they are not um, sometimes functional, and probably one of the things that we need to do after the after all is done and and we are over the pandemic is to look at uh, employment and the social security schemes and also education. Uh, there has been a lot of losses when it comes to education because of everything that was mentioned. You know the digital divide. Uh, the lack of, of access to all of these digital tools and, and of course, um, affordability. Finally, I think um, the, the pandemic really sort of um, exposed the, the inadequacies in health systems all around the world. I think the income became secondary to what the country can do because some middle income countries actually have done much better than established economies, like for example, the United States where I sit right now. Once again, thank you very much for the invitation and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Samira, for these um, interesting points, also highlighting the experience of inequities during the pandemic and stressing that the whole question of job creation and investments on education will indeed uh, gain new importance um, in post-pandemic times. So I would now, now like to continue with Dr. Bassam uh, Hijawi. He is, as already mentioned, an epidemiologist and the member of Jordan's Epidemics uh, Committee and has, again, a year-long experience in the field, is uh, 
uh, now since 2020 uh, with the Jordan Ministry of Health and before was in a different director general positions at different institutions. So thank you very much, Dr. Hijawi, for being with us also. And we're looking forward to your comments on the study. And as Jordan is generally considered as a country that has been particularly successful in addressing the health crisis, you could also <clears throat> maybe also tell us how policymakers responded to the crisis since the pandemic began and how the vaccination campaign has also been shaped in Jordan. Thanks for being with us and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, um, Professor uh, uh, Thomas, and uh, thanks for uh, ID for her representation. It's a, a wonderful uh, study and uh, it's excellent with the uh, good recommendation that, uh, but uh, my my comment that uh, you know in 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 way or another, is even it's direct or indirect, all countries uh, may affected from this uh, huge uh, pandemic. But it seems to be that uh, sometimes variability and in indicators, which is health and origin or non-health. It depends on policies that uh, uh, to be used by the countries itself. Uh, uh, it seems that uh, sometimes uh, many countries, uh, like uh, our group here, uh, the countries share in, in, in a study, uh, we have a similar uh, socioeconomic uh, condition, cultural issue, but uh, uh, usually WHO have a lot of intervention uh, uh, measures uh, uh, used by different countries, and this is affected by, by the community, the population itself. So in, in Jordan, many times uh, yani during the mass media and uh, that we are uh, we are a hot country that uh, we are because it seems to be that uh, our data on daily basis on daily basis the 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 uh, 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 through televisions and through uh, through media they declare on on daily basis and I am happy that uh, only yesterday uh, they, they stop declaration on on daily basis and uh, they took a decision that to be on on uh, on weekly uh, basis uh, 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 from next Sunday and uh, uh, during the previous two days. Nobody in Jordan, even mass media or uh, others uh, everywhere in the world, know about the, 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 the numbers, about the fatality. So we are uh, quiet now, uh, quiet now with uh, uh, yani th their uh, analysis, the people, everybody, you know, expert in, in, in the world. It analyzed the, 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 the numbers and the right that this is how many people uh, admitted to hospital. So I think a uh, testing policy of each country or case definition and uh, 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 using by the country itself uh, how uh, the percentage of uh, tested uh, 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 BCR. Uh, all these, I think, uh, affect uh, the, the, the situation, affect the measures. And uh, you know, everybody knows that Jordan, we start uh, uh, national lockdown at the beginning of the pandemic for uh, four, five months. Uh, uh, they were, we have uh, uh, a title, stay at home. And I think when uh, 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 all the countries know that this, uh, this type of pandemic, maybe at, at maximum eight months, uh, one year, but uh, if, they, if we missed uh, uh, eight months, so I think all resources of Jordan uh, using uh, to, to uh, contain this type of uh, pandemic is used for uh, official and mandatory isolation by hotels uh, uh, and uh, 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 quarantine that cost a lot for the for the country. And uh, when we lift these uh, uh, m m measures and restrictions, uh, so uh, we start like other countries to face uh, uh, waves. So, uh, for example, we are now uh, in, in wave uh, uh, caused by Omicron. 
and we have a double burden that uh, the fourth wave is uh, immediately coming uh, and uh, bold with the third wave that the cause is uh, delta and we have a lot of, of, of deaths without uh, any reasons that coming from delta and you know that omicron is uh, uh, mild uh, cases so sometimes uh, the decision taking cannot uh, convince the communities to, to collaborate with with uh, with uh, 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 the country, so uh, we we still so uh, the the government uh, lose a lot a lot of money uh, uh, costing uh, 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 preparing a vaccine. And for example, Jordan, one of the Middle East country that we have four vaccines uh, at the beginning of uh, the year uh, 2021. Uh, yani, uh, since now we have uh, 14 months uh, about using availability of uh, first vaccine on 13 of January 2021. And now we are, for example, we have a good coverage with, with the vaccines, but usually we, we are using uh, 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 yani, uh, age group uh, 18 and above. And now uh, we stop the, the education the, the previous year and we start this year. So we need to vaccine also the, the school age children. Yani, uh, uh, these variations uh, uh, affect uh, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, modeling that coming from different sources in the world. Yani, for example, the Global Health Security Index that to be used on this study. And uh, uh, we, have, we have the first, not only in the region, maybe uh, our indicators or uh, uh, used and equations for prevalence of disease and uh, for mortality, maybe we are from the, the first uh, uh, 20, 30 countries in the world. But if we uh, uh, calculate it in, in different ways, I think it is, it is the same situation like others so yani uh, uh, i think we affected from a socio economic condition uh, rumors they play a role in in, in jordan uh, as uh, the world yani uh, but uh, uh, still that uh, 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 jordan yani uh, whole of jordan has been engaged in uh, in a great uh, uh, national effort uh, to fight uh, COVID-19, and this is important. And our national committee that I am a epidemiologist, I'm before working in the Minister of Health, responsible uh, director general for primary health care. And uh, I am yani, a, a member of this national committee. It give a trust, it give a trust that the people, they want to, to hear a, a recommendation or a, a decisions or a, a, any advice to the government from this committee. And this is, uh, I think, a beautiful a lessons learned that uh, we use it for COVID uh, uh, itself. Then we have, for example, uh, many times that we face a pressure on, on uh, 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 our uh, health system, especially hospitals, uh, 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 but uh, yani, many times the media said that the uh, uh, health system to be collapsed, but uh, never. Yani, we reach uh, a lot of uh, yani, uh, 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 admitted uh, uh, rates of, of cases uh, in ICU, uh, and we have the uh, idea that we uh, built uh, four uh, uh, field hospitals uh, uh, in the north and middle and south regions, and we cope at least with mortality that affect people. Uh, uh, Minister of Health lead the way uh, to, to, to manage uh, COVID, and they use their uh, hospitals and they rent a lot of uh, private hospitals. We have a, a good coordination, but uh, uh, I think we, we affected well, a lot of people stop their work. The labor is uh, affected. Uh, we have, uh, uh, yani, for example, maternal mortality for Jordan that we have a new registry since four uh, years. We find that uh, uh, 10 cases of, of maternal mortality uh, deaths out of 60, yani 22% of uh, 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 a pregnant woman died due to, to COVID. And this is a huge number. And I, this is in 2020. Uh, and it seems to be that in 2021, the next uh, 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 report, 
uh, it seems to be that it is uh, doubled. Uh, this means that we face a lot of mortality, but uh, in general, in general condition, we are, yeah, we are happy of what we, we, we done because our system is still working. Uh, I think uh, uh, now we are in, in, uh, 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 reach the peak of the fourth uh, uh, wave that coming by Omicron. And uh, it seems to be that recommendation that is very important, Yani. Most of them of the national study uh, of, of Jordan that we, we put on that on our recommendation. Uh, hope that uh, collaboration, it seems, with, with countries, especially in a region, uh, for example, through WHO, EMRO region, uh, yani, it's weak. It's weak with Gulf area, it's weak with the North uh, Africa countries, even we are in an in, 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 in Emro region. Uh, I hope that uh, uh, the, the recommendation of the study is excellent. And I think uh, 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 tomorrow, inshallah, yeah, I present some of them in front of the committee so as to, to, to learn and to, to add. Uh, and thank you very much for your invitation. It's a good study. Uh, and uh, thank you, thank you again for everybody. My colleagues. Thank you very much, Dr. Hijawi, for your um, insights and for uh, sharing the Jordanian um, experiences. I think this was a very interesting to uh, follow, especially as you also mentioned that um, there was no uh, peak when it comes to pressure, for example, on the Jordanian health sector, in particular to hospitals. Uh, there was a strong efficiency of the health care system, even though the times uh, the media was portraying a different view and it shows that preparation is very important and that the mechanisms must work in order to then uh, have an efficient uh, handling of the sanitary crisis. And at the same time, uh, you mentioned that the peak of the Omicron wave also in Jordan most likely was uh, arrived and is now over and that the situation uh, hopefully will also become better soon in Jordan. So thank you very much also for these uh, insights. And I would now like to continue with Professor Meriem Lakda, uh, who would uh, tell us more about the lessons learned in Morocco and how Morocco dealt with the pandemic. She is a researcher with a lot of experience on um, also the topic of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. She recently also published a policy brief on the developments uh, in regard to the pandemic and the Moroccan reality. And I would uh, like to know, Professor Lakra, not only your um, now impression of the study and the main results that were presented by Professor Iadi, but also um, maybe a little bit more about the Moroccan experience. And in general, Morocco is portrayed as one of the few countries in the MENA region that is also capable of producing its own vaccine and to also export the vaccine to the African continent in general, mainly to sub-Saharan African countries. So how exactly is this going to be organized? And maybe you could also share some thoughts um, on Morocco's role in regard to the vaccination production. But in general, we are very much interested in uh, learning now your thoughts on the presented study uh, by EMEA. So Professor Lakta, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Uh, actually, I was very keen to join the discussion and I'm um, in fact very, very happy to hear the important study and the important project presented by Professor Rima Yadi, a study which is uh, actually of permanent importance in this particular moment. Um, actually, uh, it is for me also an opportunity to talk about the Moroccan experience and to discuss the measures adopted by the country and uh, as political scientist expert, uh, I will discuss the health and socioeconomic issues, uh, socioeconomic measures as well. And I will end talking about the more response to them. I will try to not discuss what uh, Professor Ayadi covered or what uh, Professor Hijawi highlighted because the case of Morocco is quite uh, close to that of Jordania. 
I will try also to move away as much as possible from uh, subjective uh, interpretation or subjective political analysis in relation to recent events in Morocco. So, in fact, as you mentioned, Mr. Thomas, um, uh, in fact, faced with uh, an unprecedented crisis, Morocco reacted actually quickly uh, and determinantly with anticipatory measures. Um, as we know, uh, to take charge of the health sector, Morocco was forced to make some economic and social sacrifices at the beginning, at the first uh, couple of months, uh, in order to, to end uh, the spread of the virus. Uh, however, actually, this measures, um, these measures taken to support and strengthen the health sector uh, to respond forcefully to the threat of COVID-19 could not last more than a few months and were no longer acceptable either, at, uh, either socially or economically. Um, in fact, it must be said that uh, the pandemic highlighted a certain number of weaknesses in the country which actually uh, prompted the, the public authorities to review the priorities of the moment by creating special funds for uh, the most affected sectors, as mentioned already by Professor Rim. Uh, so the first priority was of social dimension through the strengthening of social safety nets to mitigate the impact of the, uh, of the pandemic and by investing in the social protection and as well in the prevention of social risks as well as um, in terms of, uh, of uh, strengthening the resilience of families. Uh, we know um, also that uh, in most countries of the MENA region, as for Morocco, uh, the informal sector uh, was heavily affected by the impact of the pandemic. It is actually with this, uh, with this logic um, that at the level of the informal sector, uh, the Sadamon Fund was created uh, by the government and served to compensate the lack of resources of some citizens. Actually, Morocco had to uh, support 5 million, uh, 5 million households in difficulty, support which was actually at that time uh, provided with a certain dignity thanks to information technology, mobile telephony, uh, while respecting uh, various measures. Uh, citizens could, could actually benefit from financial aid depending on the number of families, uh, uh, family members. Um, also, um, indeed, actually, some people operating in this sector, the informal sector, uh, often live in precarious situations. And um, the economic shock that the Moroccan economy suffered from actually worsened the situation in this sector. So the purpose of this fund, the Sadamon Initiative, Sadamon Fund, was to operate in the same way as with the formal employees. Um, at the economic level, in the short term, actually the former government uh, launched a recovery plan uh, to support the investment and the competitiveness of American companies while having put in place um, affected specific programs uh, to support the tourism sector. Uh, which was actually heavily affected by the closure of the country's external borders. Um, we, we, we all know that the tourism industry in Morocco is an important economic uh, sector. It represents about 10% of the country's GDP. Um, uh, also, as part of, uh, of the support plans, uh, then the recovery plans launched by the government, uh, there was the budgetary fund allocated to economic uh, recovery worth 11% of the GDP. Uh, actually, this fund uh, reacted quickly and contributed to injecting the necessary money into the economy, uh, while served to relaunch investment through all the necessary mechanisms. Um, uh, also, um, it is uh, worth noting that um, in light of the impact of the health crisis and without public assistance during the spring 2020 to spring 21, uh, in Morocco actually poverty could, uh, I say, could have increased seven times and vulnerability twice, um, which could deepen uh, more the disparities in the country. Uh, hopefully the Tadaman Fund could overcome this threat but it, did, it didn't last, unfortunately. Um, uh, in fact, the health crisis 
has, uh, we can say that it reveals flaws in particularly social fragilities, as I said, and also at the, at the level of the informal sector, but also in the health and education sectors as well. Um, Morocco launched a reform and resilience of the health sector at the short and long term. Um, it should be noted that to strengthen the health sector, uh, Morocco uh, increased the budget allocated to it in 2021, which reached uh, close to 19 uh, million USDs and rising it to 23 million USDs in 2022. Uh, actually, it's an increase of 19 percent uh, uh, of the budget allocated to the health sector. Uh, at the short term as well, um, Thanks to these resources, actually, Morocco could ensure a rapid and effective response to COVID-19, thanks to the proactive and anticipatory management carried out by the country. Uh, this was actually transcribed when the world was experiencing its fifth wave, the Moroccan country, uh, the Mor Morocco was uh, actually experiencing the third wave. Uh, in the long term, also, in terms of resilience of the health sector and the social social sector as well, um, there is um, the, security, the social security coverage, uh, the rehabilitation of hospitals and development of human resources. Actually, it is worth noting uh, that the country suffers uh, like uh, several other countries, specifically like Tunisia, it suffers from a great lack of human resources particularly in the public sector. Uh, actually, it was witnessed during the peak of Omicron in Morocco during the recent months. Uh, public hospitals were forced to hire staff for a fixed period, particularly nurses and intensive care doctors also. Um, and I would like just to give some numbers, if you don't mind, uh, what we should highlight is that uh, Morocco, uh, in Morocco, more than 13,000 doctors work in the private sector Faced to only 12 uh, public, uh, 12,000 uh, doctors in the public sector. Uh, actually, so for a population uh, which represents more than three, 35 million inhabitants, um, the ratio should is 7.1 doctor by the, per uh, 10,000 inhabitants. Uh, Morocco is still actually, with that number, is still very far from the standard of WHO, uh, which sets the ratio to 15.3 uh, doctors per uh, 10,000 inhabitants. So uh, in this regard, um, Morocco uh, should compensate for a deficit of 97,000 uh, uh, doctors, uh, professionals, in general health professionals. Um, um, what I can uh, discuss also uh, in the in the short term, um, Morocco uh, launched the free vaccination campaign against COVID-19 since January 28, uh, 2021, uh, a campaign almost successful at the start with a figure of 76% uh, of the population vaccinated, uh, which is close, uh, which is more than 22 million Moroccans vaccinated so far. Uh, Morocco aims to approach a collective immunity by vaccinating 80% of the population, uh, close to 30 million people. Um, actually, there was a diversified access to vaccines. Uh, we had Sinopharm, AstraZeneca, Pfizer um, um, uh, through uh, multilateral, bilateral agreements and donations from COVAX. Um, Morocco, as well as you mentioned, Mr. Thomas, Morocco launched in July 2021 the construction of a uh, um, um, vaccine manufacturer. Uh, the objective is to manufacture between uh, the years 2022-2025 uh, the active substance of more than 20 vaccines and biotherapeutic products, including actually three vaccines against the coronavirus which will cover more than 70% of the kingdom's population of the population of Moroccan, uh, Moroccan needs and more than 60% of those of African continent. Um, uh, also, uh, there is another point that I want to discuss uh, briefly at the end, uh, is to know more about the response of the Moroccans to the measures taken by the government, as you mentioned, uh, from March, uh, actually from March 2020 to now. Um, based on several statistics I made, I conducted actually the measures taken by the government were approved by Morocans at the beginning, uh, precisely at the beginning of the containment. 
um, the figures show that 86% uh, of the, the Moroccans approved the containment and curfew measures, 90% were in favor of ban of gathering, etc. Um, however, these figures have recently uh, significantly changed since the second half of 2021. Uh, and young people were the least satisfied. Uh, actually, this is uh, a trend uh, which is um, which is uh, clearly found in Morocco, but also in Tunisia. Uh, in Morocco, about 43% said they were not anymore satisfied with the recent government uh, measures uh, taken. Um, actually, it should be noticed that since the second half of the 2021, Morocco adopted and imposed second policies, uh, certain policies, such as imposing the vaccination, uh, imposing the vaccination fast, which actually has sparked revolts uh, of citizens. Uh, thus, since the introduction of the compulsory vaccination fast in October 2021, uh, there hasn't been unanimous support among Moroccans, despite progress not noticed in the vaccination campaign. So um, the, the government, actually the government's decision um, has aroused strong indignation among Moroccan citizens, uh, which led to protests, marches in the streets of different Moroccan cities. And up to now, every Sunday in front of the parliament in Rabat. So the obligation of the vaccination fast actually fuels uh, to this day, uh, lively debates between pro and anti-vax. Uh, so actually today, if a Moroccan citizen a uh, citizen didn't receive his three doses, he will not be, or she will not be able to, to have his passport or to renew his or her ID. Uh, so, which actually um, is not approved by Moroccans. Uh, and another last element that I would like to discuss briefly is, um, and which is somehow related to the pandemic, is the rise witnessed at the level of the consumer price index which recorded actually an increase of uh, 3.1, sorry, during the month of January, 2022. Uh, Moroccan citizens are still actually in a period of difficulty and have not yet recovered from the still existing uh, socioeconomic repercussions of the pandemic. And it is at this particular moment that the new government decides to take its first decision and to withdraw the support of food stuff allocated to the compensation fund the Moroccan Compensation Fund, uh, which actually caused the increase in prices of food products, and especially in times of um, aridness in Morocco these days. Um, so I think that I covered uh, most of the elements you talked about. So uh, just a brief overview of Moroccan health measures, as well as the governmental, social, and economic responses how Moroccan citizens have reacted to them since the outbreak of the pandemic up to now. Uh, actually, in respect of time, uh, I tried to avoid talking, discussing the, the, the long-term measures in the health sector taken by Morocco and the recent riots in Morocco. But if there is a question about it, I will be more than happy to, to, to answer it. So thank you for your attention and I give the floor to Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Thank you very much for this great overview about the, the one inside socioeconomic consequences that were faced due to the pandemic in Morocco. And on the other side, also on this very interesting um, uh, elaboration on the general health sector resilience in Morocco. It's striking that 7.1 doctors per 10,000 inhabitants are there in Morocco, as you mentioned, whereas this seems to be still under the average. Um, and also an interesting figure that there are 13,000 doctors in the private sector, whereas only 12,000 in the public sector. But still you underline the diversification of the access to vaccines that since the beginning were present in Morocco. So thank you very much for this also. And now we have 15 minutes for quite a number of very interesting questions and I tried to bring them together already. So addressing Professor Rum Ayadi first, I would maybe start with four questions uh, to, um, to be uh, kindly asked, answered. The first one, 
uh, was already asked at the very beginning of your presentation, Professor Ayadi, and that is um, a question in regard to how you estimate that out-of-pocket expenditure, uh, expenditures were decreased in the presented target countries, and if there is available data uh, in this regard. A second question that I think would also be interesting to see from your perspective is how the uh, transnational um, international institutions and their actions were kind of um, successful or how successful they were in implementing their measures in the region, be it the World Bank, the UN, the EU. So how successful were these international institutions? And I think another uh, question that is quite interesting that came up at the end was now, if we know something about the uh, health impact of the pandemic on Syrian and Palestinian refugees, for example, in Lebanon, so maybe you could elaborate on these three questions first. Thank you. Well, thank you, Thomas, uh, very much for these questions. Um, and I would like first to thank uh, the discussant for uh, very uh, uh, comprehensive uh, feedback on, uh, on the study, but also um, uh, raising key points, uh, which certainly we will take into consideration in our future research. Um, so on the questions, starting with the out-of-pocket, uh, the data is available from the WHO, uh, and there is a clear uh, decreasing trend from uh, 2000 to 2019. Uh, so this is based on the estimations of the WHO for the MENA region. Uh, so if we take, uh, for example, uh, the data for uh, Egypt, for example, I mean, uh, this is the data uh, publicly available. So you just need to go to WHO uh, and then uh, type the countries you would like to see. And then you will see the evolution per country. But overall, in the MENA region, there has been a uh, decreasing trend of out-of-pocket uh, expenses. Now in Egypt, this has increased uh, in the last year. So from, uh, from probably 17 to uh, 19, okay? So this is for the first question. Uh, second question on the success of international organization. This is a difficult question. Uh, we, did not, uh, uh, we did not evaluate or examine uh, the factors of success. Uh, first of all, we need to first agree which are the factors of success. Um, of, uh, of the, I would say, the uh, interventions of the international organizations. Mm -hmm. And then uh, probably we need to wait a bit more, maybe one year, to make a firm assessment on their interventions, but not only in MENA region, in the countries that we are assessing, uh, but also globally, because they have, as uh, Dr. Samira mentioned, there, uh, for example, in the case of the World Bank, the intervention was global. Now, if I look at the factors of success, uh, one key factor, I would say, is the speed of distribution, for example, of, of whatever vaccine, okay, and the approved vaccine by the WHO, that's number one. Um, but also uh, the investments, uh, or I would say the, uh, the support, the financial support that has been, or that would have been given to uh, countries, uh, for example, that have suffered more than others. For example, if we take the case uh, of uh, Lebanon, uh, knowing that Lebanon has uh, suffered dramatically uh, during the pandemic, and not only because of the pandemic uh, itself, perhaps the pandemic became a minor thing, uh, facing other, I mean, other crises, like the political crisis, the sovereign crisis, the, economic crisis, the social crisis, uh, and, and all of this, uh, I mean, you need to have really very strong support to be able to, uh, to manage uh, such a difficulty. Um, and I think these are all aspects that need to be looked at uh, from an international organization perspective, because you don't only have uh, 
I mean, the health crisis, but then the ramification from health crisis to economic crisis to political crisis, social crisis, and then sometimes beyond. We didn't have the opportunity to work on, for example, uh, to do the assessment or the analysis for Syria and for uh, Libya. We would like to, but then accessing the information, accessing the real situation in these countries is extremely difficult. Now, the third question you mentioned uh, is about the um, refugees. Uh, we did not focus on the refugees, unfortunately. This should lead to a specific study on it, uh, on all the refugees, uh, not only in the case of uh, Syria and other countries or Palestine, but then nowadays uh, the refugees will increase and then we will see, I think, uh, I would look at Thomas, perhaps you need to think of having a specific study on, uh, on the refugees and uh, how they, they leave this pandemic. Thank you also for these answers. Indeed, that's another interesting uh, topic, I think. We have also um, some questions I would address to Dr. Samira. So maybe two concrete ones. The one is, uh, how is the general financial a damage of the pandemic uh, to the region so far? Can we say something about it? So the financial damage to the uh, region due to the pandemic. And the second one, uh, should uh, the World Bank focus more uh, on supporting um, the status quo uh, when it comes to the health sectors in the region or is now this pandemic a chance for change was asked. So these two questions, please. Sure, I'll take the second one first. Um, not because it's easier of, of the two, but because it just comes to mind immediately. I think uh, our own existence is not to support the status quo, although we sometimes contribute to, the, to where countries are. Um, I think we're always forward looking and um, that notion of health system strengthening is, is, is universal. It's not just in, in, in the MENA region. And it is really uh, three, three dimensions. The first one is the political will and that social contract between governments and the people. And this, is, this actually is a lot of discussion when it comes to MENA because in light of what's been happening in the evolution and in the um, reforms that we have witnessed in the past 10 to 12 years, the second one is you actually have to have the fiscal uh, um, uh, envelope to actually increase uh, spending on health. Uh, in, 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 in dysfunctional economies, this doesn't happen and it doesn't happen easily. And it's again a universal phenomenon. And the third thing is that the responsibility for health is not just about the biomedical model, you know, increasing, in increasing supply, but it also takes into consideration all of these preventative factors, like you know, being responsible for one's health is actually cornerstone, and it actually goes right into the uh, into the health system strengthening because the health system is everything that would contribute to a good uh, health outcome, not just clinics and hospitals and medications and vaccines and tests and and what have you. So obviously, we don't want to to support the status quo. We want to, countries to advance. And although going back to the status quo is a wish right now, because we've seen a lot of regress. And um, I didn't, I didn't focus a little bit in my intervention on how the essential health services have been actually uh, declining. And and um, Dr. Hajjah, we talked about the maternal mortality, and we thought that this is a legacy issue that we've actually closed the books on women dying in childbirth. But it turns out that. The pandemic actually had sort of took us back many decades when it comes to essential health services. The second thing that I also would like to put on the table is the, um, the cross-cutting issues uh, and poverty is being tackled, but also gender. I think if any pandemic that would have a face, it would be the face of a woman. From the female-headed households that actually suffering income uh, severance to, uh, to lack of access to education, to uh, gender-based violence, including early marriage and what have you. So uh, I, I think this all leads to uh, the value added of what the bank is doing. And the second question is on the, um, you know, I, I think that the, the, the issue of the, um, of, of the impact of, uh, of, of the economy is, is, is a big one. And, and I think 
the, the, the relief, and I'm not an economist, I'm a physician, but I, I also work a lot in, 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 in low and middle income countries. And the economy has a very, very daunting uh, uh, imprint on, on how, how countries are, are, are going forward. So again, um, in MENA, I think the recovery is going to take a little bit of time. It's not going to happen within the context of this year or next year. And this has also to do with all the, the crises that we are living right now, you know, the oil prices, the inflammation, uh, the inflation, the, um, the uh, cli climbing um, uh, prices of essential commodities like food and, 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 and energy. So I think this is, we're not looking at a very bright picture. I'm sorry to say that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much also for um, these responses. And maybe a uh, last one to Professor um, Lakdar, uh, which was also uh, interesting uh, regarding the role of NGOs to mitigate the impact of the pandemic. Could you maybe state um, how the situation was uh, in Morocco when it comes to non-governmental organizations? and their role in the mitigation of the pandemic and in general, maybe also give another overview of how the media influenced uh, the, let's say, public opinion about the management of the pandemic, especially as also Dr. Hejawi mentioned the role of the media before. So Professor Lakta, please. Um, actually, uh, thank you for these questions. And there is another question that I would like to, to answer, if you don't mind, by the end. Uh, actually, uh, talking about the role of NGOs, actually, we have um, the, the role played by the civil society was very, very important in Morocco, uh, precisely during the confinement uh, period. And actually, there has been five, um, five main important uh, NGOs working uh, in Morocco during that time, working in the field. And this, um, actually, uh, the US Ed supported uh, uh, the Moroccan civil society at precisely these five NGOs respond and adapt to the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, um, this partnership actually uh, enabled them to, to strengthen their ability to, to work effectively on assisting families in difficulty, on helping people to, to get more access to medical assistance. And, uh, and actually, it, it was very, very important at that time. Um, uh, you raise a question also about uh, the media. Actually, uh, at the beginning, uh, the media uh, portrayed uh, portrayed the situation uh, um, uh, neutrally, objectively. The numbers given, the statistics proposed and given were uh, objective and reflected actually the reality. Uh, but in fact, in the recent periods, uh, since the second half of 2021, we see that there is a, um, a redirection of the mass media. Uh, and recently, as I mentioned, uh, recently we witnessed in, in Morocco uh, several riots, manifestations of the people. And the media actually didn't, uh, didn't discuss any of, this, uh, any of these manifestations, actually, any of these riots. Um, as, uh, as you know, um, faced the, the the increase uh, of the the food uh, of the food uh, products increase uh, in the the price of the food products actually uh, we had uh, during the 20th uh, 20th february last 20th february manifestations in different cities of morocco and the media didn't uh, uh, didn't uh, portray or didn't uh, show anything about it. So uh, with the, the advent of the new government, what we witness is that uh, the media is uh, actually uh, more rooted towards, uh, towards uh, projecting what the new government wants the world to see and wants the Moroccans to see more than anything else. And um, actually, there is a question that I've read, uh, if you don't mind, that I want to, to, to answer. Uh, Mr. Thomas, it's a question about uh, the mismanagement of the health sector. Uh, may I answer this question? Sure, go ahead. Okay. Uh, actually, um, 
<laughs> it has been said that there is more uh, uh, mismanagement of human resources than uh, than anything uh, than something else. Actually, actually, what we need to talk about uh, about the resilience of the health sector uh, at the, in the long term. Uh, actually, uh, the, re, the, the the budget allocated to the health sector often debate about uh, the health uh, about how to reshape the health sector by expanding the budget allocated to it. Uh, the budget actually uh, remains. Uh, according to several analysts in the field, it remains insufficient. Um, in reality, this spending, as huge as it seems to me precisely, because I'm not an economist and talking in terms of millions of USDs, it's very, very uh, huge for me. But uh, in fact, when I look at, uh, I make a prospection of the numbers, I read the numbers, what I found is that the spending represents only 8.7 of the general budget of the, of the country, of the state, uh, which uh, ranks it, Morocco at the 103rd rank out of uh, 171 countries, uh, which means that uh, this 8.7 is well below the rate uh, recommended by the, the World Health Organization, which was 20%. So in terms of the resilience of the health sector, if actually we start from the fact that this budget is used for the inclusion of 22 million Moroccans in social security coverage, also for, as I mentioned, uh, uh, precedently, uh, development of human resources, but also um, uh, to deal with possible epidemics and enhance the health sector to deal with the increase in long term of infections, chronic diseases, and other diseases. So, from this point of view, we conclude that this budget remains insufficient, and logically, the budget of the Ministry of Health must be. Uh, between 40 and 50 million USDs instead of 23 uh, million. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, please, Dr. Please, uh, Amin Jawi. Yes, I anyhow wanted to give you the okay. floor. Uh, so, um, if you want to comment something in general to the discussion, please feel free. If not, I also have another question for you regarding the digitalization uh, strategy of Jordan. So, um, Jordan is known for its uh, strong digitalization efforts. So, are there also any considerations to further digitize, for example, the Jordanian healthcare system? Uh, let's say, for example, by the means of electronic health records. Yeah, let, let me first comment on uh, comment on uh, uh, two previous uh, questions uh, regarding refugees. We have a good experience in Jordan with Syrian refugees, because uh, we have a two uh, uh, for regarding Syrian refugees. We have two types. Uh, uh, one registered uh, by UNHCR, and they are uh, in camps, inside camps, and they are easily for Minister of Health and uh, the decision maker to, to uh, vaccine them. So uh, they are a higher vaccination rate uh, 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 than, than the community, the Jordanian. And uh, the others, the Syrian, pooled with the host community, usually they consider them as Jordanian and they have a chance to, to be vaccines. Because, uh, you know, uh, uh, our EBI system, Expanded Program Organization in Jordan, uh, is be, and also is be, uh, through uh, pandemics, uh, 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 yeah, usually it's free of charge and uh, uh, by law. Uh, this is one. Regarding the volunteers and NGOs, I have a bad experience of that because I am a public health man. Uh, usually they, they replace uh, the public health trained people, uh, especially for uh, yani in, uh, 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 preparing and helping in uh, vaccination sessions. And the most important in uh, epidemiological investigation, uh, tracing, contact tracing. And this is difficult for them. So I think uh, 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 public health people uh, uh, usually uh, they have a poor chance to to share 
This is, uh, uh, I understand it also from the neighbors countries for Jordan, that uh, poor uh, sharing their experience with epidemiological investigation and contact tracing. Uh, third that you ask me, Professor Thomas, uh, uh, digital uh, 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 and electronics, we benefit from that. Uh, so as every uh, surveillance system tools for infectious disease now is changed in the ministry. And this is a challenge for us, uh, learning it from the application that uh, used uh, uh, to, to register people for uh, vaccine people and registered uh, uh, contact tracing, epidemiological information. So I, I think we benefited from that after uh, we, uh, inshallah, finished from the pandemic that uh, our surveillance system for infectious disease, uh, preparedness and uh, detect think uh, epidemics, uh, uh, early detecting epidemics and warning that to be used not manual in the, in the, in the near future uh, to be used in the electronics. This is very important. We learned it from uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the pandemic. And also for face-to-face -face education, uh, now uh, Minister of Education, uh, it's a lessons learned, uh, prepare themselves to have a, a hybrid model of, of teaching. Now, uh, they, they benefited from face-to-face uh, -face education and uh, uh, online education. Uh, they prepare their schools, uh, uh, and I hope that this, uh, this is for us a lesson learned for Jordan to, to build and enhancement and uh, empower uh, our uh, uh, system, even learning or teaching system, and I think also for uh, uh, health, uh, national health system. Thank you very much. And now, Professor Rumayadi, please, as the last speaker, with the privilege, obviously, as a co-host. First of all, uh, I would like to thank you, Thomas, for moderating this session. That was really great, very informative, and very, um, I mean, giving us more food for thought to continue this research, uh, particularly on the recoveries. And I can say that uh, with what is happening in the world and particularly in Europe, uh, the recovery will be very bumpy and very difficult. Um, and the Mediterranean uh, region, particularly the countries that they don't have uh, the, um, I would say the appropriate fiscal space to tackle what is happening, what will happen in the next weeks and next months. Um, this will be a difficult period for all. Um, and uh, I wanted to add one point on the digitalization. I think uh, digitalization is a pillar if uh, it is also, uh, uh, if the uh, challenges are, uh, are tackled uh, while in advance. Uh, it means everything related to cybersecurity. I think this is extremely important, but not only cybersecurity, uh, but also uh, GDPR issues, for example, you know, privacy issues, data privacy issues, data storage issues, where this is all going to uh, be done, uh, what, are the reg what are the regulations uh, that need to be uh, put in place to ensure that our data, particularly when we reach uh, our health data, e-health data, will be managed and who is managing it and how it's going to be used and misused. So, I think uh, it is very important before we jump into a, a, a I would say, a trend uh, to prepare for the worst. And then I think this is the best way we all can do. So this is why assessing, uh, collecting the information that is needed is essential. Uh, and then also this should be the role of the government. Another point I wanna make uh, is also uh, public health. I think public health is important because we've seen that in countries where they have private health, um, like, for example, in the case of uh, Lebanon, the situation has not been easy at all. So investing in public health, primary, pri 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 primary pri public health is essential, really essential. And it has to continue. We are very far behind uh, the thresholds, so it needs to continue. I think this is all what I want to say. Thank you very much, Thomas and uh, Conrad Adenauer Stiftung for supporting this study. And then we will continue collaborating for uh, enhancing at least knowledge on uh, certain important topics for the regions and beyond. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Umayadi, for your kind words and especially for conducting this study, which is out now. So we shared already the link here in the chat function. You can find the study now online and we will also send it out and share it online and on social media. I would like to thank Dr. Samira al Tuwajri from the World Bank, uh, Dr. Bassam Hijawi from the Jordan's Epidemics Committee and Professor Maryam Lakta from the University um, Sidi Mohammed Ben Abdullah in Morocco for sharing their uh, interesting expertise. Thanks to uh, Professor Rumayadi and Emea for conducting this study. Thank you all for being with us. All the best and keep in touch. Have a nice evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.